right, so that's the gospel reading, and now we move into our message for this morning. Uh, we continue our quick look uh, in Paul's writing in 1 Thessalonians regarding the coming of the Lord. So last week we were looking at uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, where Paul addressed the apparent concern of some believers who were concerned that uh, those other believers who had passed away uh, may somehow miss out on the blessings of the event of the return of Christ. Those asleep, meaning dead, will be brought along by Jesus. Uh, when Jesus is coming, they will be raised first, and then those still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In other words, becoming his royal escort as he comes. Just as a dignitary in those days would be met outside the city and escorted back, so Christ's own sheep will be in his entourage as he returns. His return then for those in Christ will be a triumphant day. For those still in their sin it will be a very terrible day. So last week, I began the message by reading the last verse first. Do you remember why I did that? Because the last verse in chapter 4 said, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In the passage we read last week then, this was the one imperative command in the whole passage, the one thing that the believer was uh, supposed to do as an action. Notice he did not say, Pay close attention to CNN or Fox News or MSNBC. He did not say, spend at least half of your time in the church trying to figure out the timeline of the return of Christ. Rather, he says to encourage one another with these words. What words? Just a reminder that Christ is coming. And whether you die in the faith or you're still alive when he comes, you will be with him. So now we're going to move... That's just a recap of last week. It's already getting good, right? So now we're going to move into chapter 5 and the first 11 verses. And again, I find it appropriate to read the last verse first. Because here's the last verse of this section. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. In case you thought for a moment I've mixed up the two passages, this is not the case. Rather, Paul is repeating in a slightly different phrasing what he said earlier. The response of the Christian is to encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So Paul is not commanding something new, but saying to this church that you have been encouraging and building up, keep up the good work. Okay, now that I've given away the ending again, let's go look at the whole passage and then let's see what we can learn from it. So let's go back to chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in the darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation." For God has not destined us to, for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Now, before I begin our verse-by-verse -verse breakdown of this passage, let's remember what our theme and focus of these last several weeks have been and that is evangelism and inviting others into the church to hear the word of the God proclaimed. So we are, have been in a period of prayer asking God to give us new souls that will come into our, his kingdom, asking him to fill our hearts with compassion and love for the lost and that we may be able to welcome them in and teach them and help them to grow in the faith and adopt them into our Oasis family just as God adopts them into his great family. 
When we look at 1 Thessalonians, especially these last two chapters, these are verses that ought to encourage us greatly and spur us on to love the world around us, and especially those in close proximity to us, enough to give them the gospel truth. So just as Paul thought it important to remind the church of the promised second coming of the Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ, who will come in glory and majesty, but also with fierce judgment towards those who reject him. And throughout all of church history, people have been concerned with wanting to know, when will this happen? On the one hand, that's perfectly normal probably to have some curiosity, In every generation, people have been faced with some events that cause them to despair or to be more certain that the coming of Christ is right around the corner. There's no way he won't come before Caesar does this or that. There is no way he won't come before this inquisition is over. There's no way he won't come before the Germans get to France. There's no way he won't come before X, Y, Z. And certainly there are plenty of modern so-called prophets who continue to make predictions. When I first came to my previous church, someone gave me some CDs on the blood moons, and I listened to them. Well, I listened to about one and a half of the messages, and I couldn't take it anymore. And the lady who gave this uh, CD collection to me, she insisted These blood moons were symbols and signs that we as believers must be sharing things like this so no one's caught off guard because these blood moons were the indication that everything was going to finally wrap up. Well, the blood moons came and went. There's been several since. Nothing happened. Yet, those who made those predictions, did they lose their audiences? Sadly, no. Despite Scripture telling us that if someone makes a declaration of something happening and it doesn't happen, they are not a prophet. Many go about saying they have a word from the Lord or a prediction. Their word doesn't come true. The dates do not work out. And rather than people leaving them, they excuse the error. When I was a boy, it was 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988. Does anyone remember that one? People throughout church history have been writing books like this. A few years ago, a lady that I know got caught up in following some rancher from Oklahoma or Texas or somewhere uh, who developed a following on the internet who actually set a date of return for Christ. And this lady even made statements the week before like she wouldn't see us next week at church. We would all be with Jesus. The next Sunday, did she even act sheepish? No. Did she stop listening to the rancher? No, I went to see what this guy was saying on his Facebook page or whatever he was on. And like a lot of these so-called prophets, he would say things like, oh, if your pastor isn't preaching these things, you need to get out of there. Don't trust pastors. He was really like, you know, says the guy sitting at his kitchen table recording crazy predictions on a laptop, you know. Um, Well, I, for one, I'm going to stick with the word of God. Thank you very much. Second Peter 121 says, For no po- a prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, before I get too far off on that subject, let's get back to our passage. Verse 1, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Why do they have no need to have anything written to them? Because they've already been taught this. Jesus himself clearly taught that date guessing is a waste of time. Be aware of your surroundings. Watch and see what's going on in the world by all means, but be careful about trying to figure out when Christ is coming. The point is not the when, but the assurance that it will happen. Jesus told his followers that many people would be falsely proclaiming things about his return. In Matthew 24, Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will arise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 
And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Let's move on to verse 2 in 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus used several illustrations about the suddenness and surprise that his coming would entail. He also used the illustration of a thief or a burglar. The burglar doesn't set up an appointment to let you know he's coming. I got a text this week, earlier in the week, from our pest control guy. We will be servicing your house on Friday. The burglar doesn't send a text. He shows up when you do not expect it. So it will be when Jesus comes. If you do not expect him to come today, then be ready because he said he will come when you do not expect it. Verse 3, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So the day of the Lord will not come as many seem to think on a day when the world seems as unstable as can be. It will come when things seem peaceful. As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. This was in the days before epidurals, by the way. And the medicines that can slow down or even reverse early labor, which we're thankful for. In those days when the labor pains came, the pregnancy was coming to an end. The baby was coming, whether mom and dad were prepared for it or not. So that was then. However, the people of God should not be surprised. Even though the timing of this event is unknown to us, it should not be a surprise. Why? Because we should always be ready. First Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Leon Morris wrote in his commentary on this, in strong contrast with the fate of these unbelievers is the situation of those in Christ. The apostle makes use of a word play. The day of the Lord passes over into the day or the light in which Christians live. Paul develops the thought of living as children of the day. So we are to be children of light, living with soberness. Verses 9 and 10 then, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Now, I want to talk about this for a moment because some believers still fall prey to the teachers who say, well, if you come to Christ, then life will be easy. You'll be protected from all evil. You will never get sick. You'll have wealth and so on. Also, many Christians believe that they'll be rescued by the rapture and never get persecuted. This is one of the verses they point to. God has not destined us for wrath, they'll say. Therefore, uh, I'll be snatched up before anything bad ever happened to me. Well, the logic is we're not destined to wrath, then we'll be removed, right? Before God pours out his wrath in the judgment bowls. Well, it is definitely the case that believers will not endure the wrath of God. It is also definitely true that we will at times endure the wrath of people. And the wrath of Satan. When you read the apocalyptic literature in the Bible, it is clear that Christians will be targets of the Antichrist and the beast. So when Paul writes that God has not destined us for wrath, he's not talking about the wrath of people or the wrath of Satan. Certainly Paul himself could not have said that. He endured all kinds of wrath. What he is saying here is that we who are in Christ are not destined to receive the wrath of God. And that's a very good thing because the wrath of God is what Christ already took on our behalf on the cross. 
Romans 5, 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from what? The wrath of God. So R.C. Sproul used to say to people, uh, what are we saved? Saved from what? He actually had a book called Saved From What? Because people would say, well, I'm saved. What are you saved from? And people would say, well, I'm saved from my sin. I'm saved from uh, a bad life. I'm saved. From what are we actually saved from? The wrath of God. So this is the same wrath Paul had written about earlier in Romans chapter 1 in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. But Jesus delivers us from that wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So that's wrath, God's wrath that we're delivered from not man's wrath. We still may endure persecution or mistreatment. This wrath of God, which sinners are storing up against themselves, will be poured out, but those in Christ will not be subjected to that. We will endure wrath from people, but not from God. We are spared from that because Jesus already took the wrath. Remember what Jesus said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. So Christians will have tribulation. He said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. The promises of Christ are sure, but he does not promise us an easy life now. Only in the eternal life will we enjoy perfect bliss and peace and joy forever. Jesus said that his elect would be gathered after the tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. He goes on to tell some parables in that same passage about the day and the hour which nobody knows. Now, I want to finish what we started, and then we're going to spend a few more minutes talking about what this means in our obedience to the Great Commission. Remember why Paul is saying these things. Back to verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another and build one another up. This is the great challenge we're given this morning. Encourage one another and build one another up. As we have taken this challenge to obey the Great Commission, we need to encourage one another and build one another up. Reminding one another of the promised second coming of Christ, we challenge each other to proclaim the gospel to those around us. Now, we have our invites ready. I mentioned that earlier, so you can start handing those out to invite folks to come to church this December. I want to give you... A little bit of a warning with that, though. That when they come, they are going to hear the word of God preached forcefully and without apology, and that may offend them. They may say to you, I cannot believe you go there. That preacher is so narrow-minded. Why do you go where they talk about sin and repentance? You see, the preaching this December will be full of the love of God, But the message of the gospel is a stumbling block. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. I saw this on Twitter this week. I'm going to quote this. A guy named Tom Troy Frazier. I don't know who he is, but I saw it, and I thought this was great. Uh, He said, you aren't wrong. Something has changed in our pulpits. Sermons back then were different than sermons today. It's not just sinners in the hands of an angry God. Whether it's Cotton Mather's What Must I Do to Be Saved or Calvin's Passion of the Christ or John Wesley's Sermon on Raising Children, there is a different atmosphere to the sermons of the past. Spurgeon once said he knew the people of his church weren't saved because if they were, the London crime rate wouldn't be so high. B.B. Warfield once called out too many in his congregation for being empty, clanging gongs. Basil once said that the greatest donor in his church was death. Because people only gave through their wills. Those those were preachers who weren't afraid to tell the congregations the truth. These are men who spoke with urgency. 
Spurgeon once compelled his congregation, commanded them, begged them, reasoned with them, bargained with them, in the end said, if I have left off any other way to tell you to come to Christ, do not let the method put you off, just come to Christ. Increase, as a name of another preacher, once preached to his congregation that self-murder, that suicide, was a sin, and later a man told him he was planning to say goodbye to the church and die that day. Samson Ockham told a man literally about to be hanged as the execution preacher this man requested. There was only one minute left to repent before he burned forever. Then he turned to the audience for the execution and told them all that this was the fate of their, of their congregants if they didn't take the call to preach Christ seriously. Lemuel Hayes once preached against universal salvation the very minute a universalist stepped out of the pulpit. He didn't wait until the next week. He preached right then. Peter Kierkegaard, late in the evening after an entire Mormon service at, his mother, at a friend's house, then gave a two-hour rebuttal to the Mormons while people checked the Bible for every reference he made to Scripture. He didn't say next week we'll give a Bible study on it. He did it right then. Why were they urgent? They knew they had to be. D.L. Moody once was worried he'd whip his congregation into making an emotional decision for Christ, so he told his congregation that next week he'd make an altar call, that this week... Think long and hard about it, and next week come ready to give God your life. And as they sang the last song of the day, he heard city bells ringing. Before he could even get home, half the city was ablaze in the great Chicago fire. Several of his congregants died, and he never again preached before that congregation. His church went up with the flames. He vowed to never make that mistake again. Spurgeon, while preaching, had a similar fire incident. When a man shouted fire in his very crowded church, the people ran for the doors. Many were injured and people died. He learned that people sitting in his church pews that week might not be the next. Jonathan Edwards, early in his revival preaching, got the unexpected news that his uncle, convinced that he would never be saved, had killed himself. If not for the preaching of Whitfield in his church a year later, that might have ended the Great Awakening forever. Listening to Whitfield, he realized the words had not damned his uncle, but that if he did not preach again, others may be lost. He felt surrendered and renewed again. These men knew that the words of the gospel were life, and that the preaching of it meant everything, that the days were urgent. They weren't worried about sound bites, book deals, conference speakers, podcasts, social media tweets, or all these other things that we care about today. They knew the call was urgent, and the gospel was powerful when preached by those who believe it. After years of reading their sermons, two things stand out again and again. They believe the Bible and preach it in such a way that makes you believe it as well. If you read Jonathan Edwards' sermons, you would never come out thinking he does not believe in heaven and believe in hell. It's clear on every line. And secondly, they are courageous. No matter the cost, they will tell you the truth. No matter the audience, they will share God's truth. Ambrose preached while Roman guards tried to enter the building and said, if we die, at least let us be useful in our deaths as the dumb donkey Christ rode in on. These are two things that stand out throughout the greats of church history. Whether it's the early church fathers or the recently deceased, Those who are remembered bear these two distinctions clearly. Belief in God's word and courage. They don't have to be seminary educated, but many are. They don't have to be in front of thousands, but some were. They don't have to have an amazing voice, though some did. They don't have to be funny, though they could be. The two things that unite poets like Richard Sibbs, young men like Andrew Gray, old lions like Warfield and Macon, and passionate preachers like Spurgeon and Wesley is this, belief and courage. Let us go and preach and teach and minister in such a way. Let us believe God's word so truly it draws others to believe it. And let us do so courageously without the fear of man entering the picture. And let us be urgent for the days are shorter than we realize. End quote. Every time we have visitors in the church, I'm hopeful. Maybe they'll join us and become part of us. Maybe they will receive the gospel. Yet many visitors never return. You could blame lots of things. A location was bad. There were no cappuccinos. We don't have the right kids program. We don't have a fancy enough building. The website's not engaging enough. But really what we must realize is that while these things may have some effect and people may say those things are the reasons that really what is lacking is their own desire to be in a church. 
Many people wander from church to church. They say, uh, I'm checking out all my options before I settle into one church. They may say, oh, I didn't feel the message. They may say, the preacher preaches and I don't like that. Give me a storyteller or a comedian instead. Give me someone more handsome. However, what is needed is the power of God to draw people to himself. There's no formula we can use to accomplish this. The only thing we can do is ask him to do it. We know that we must, what we must do, of course. We must preach the word, and yet sometimes the word is preached and not received. We are to be friendly and hospitable, yet being friendly will not keep everyone in their seat. We should try to have ways to serve those who come in, yet some will never fully engage, no matter how much you do for them. What then? Our kindness will never, ever save anyone. The only thing that saves is the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We share the gospel, and it has the power of God in it. But no one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws them to him. Who said that? Jesus. John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what do we do then? We plead with God to draw men to himself, while at the same time asking for his empowerment and grace in our lives as we go out and share the gospel with others. We ask him to help us not to be discouraged, not to get worthy, weary of doing good. And when someone comes to Christ, we give all glory to God because it wasn't our nice church or our nice presentation that brought them to belief. It is the power of God. He gets all the glory and all the honor, so let us keep praying to him and pleading with him to do the very powerful work in and through us. The day of the Lord is coming. For those in Christ, the day of the Lord will be a day of wonder and triumph. You cannot imagine. Take all the greatest emotions people have ever had, the celebrations at D-Day, the winning of a sporting event, the joy of a new baby. Combine every ecstatic emotion that you've ever felt and multiply it by a thousand, and this will not suffice to compare it with the joy of seeing our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he who is without sin, who became sin, the Lamb who became a lion, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus then he will be coming and we will meet him in the air and escort him to his great victory finally and once and for all over all sin and death and Satan. If you are in Christ on that day, you will be rejoicing and that rejoicing will continue through all eternity. Jesus is so wonderful, so amazing, so awesome, so worthy of praise that it will take all of eternity for us to express our adoration and praise to him. It will be always up and always in as we continue to know him in a true and honest way, unhindered by sin and its consequences because he has washed us completely clean. We will know peace that passes all understanding and the amazing reality that never again will we have to worry about paying the mortgage or the food bill. We don't have to worry about our relative who is sick because there will be no sickness. The curse will be lifted forever. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. That is the day of the Lord for the believer. And much more could be said. Yet for the unbeliever, it will be a terrifying time. A horrible experience you cannot imagine. If you cannot imagine the wonders of heaven, neither can you imagine the horrors of hell. If all the descriptions of heaven and scripture are but a reflection and are descriptions of the wrath of God being poured out also, and all sinners who have not repented of sin and turned to Christ will endure for all eternity the pouring out of the wrath of God, which they are storing up for themselves with each day and with each new sin. And so our job is to evangelize, and that job to evangelize must take on a new seriousness, Oasis Church. Which eternity will you have? How about your neighbor or your coworker or your family members? Do we have the compassion we need towards them? Do we concern ourselves enough to warn them of the wrath to come? Would we water down the gospel to make it all seem very nice? Please take Jesus and do me a solid. 
Or do we plead with people to abandon their sin and cling to the cross of Christ? So yes, please take the invites and invite people to hear the gospel. I promise you this, the gospel will be preached every Sunday in December. I will be as clear as I can be with the Lord's help. You need to know, though, that your guest who comes to visit may hate the gospel. And they may hate you for having brought them. They may never be warm towards you again. The gospel divides people. Jesus told us it would. Are you willing to take that risk? For the sake of the glory of God, who is glorified when we're obedient to him, will you take the risk of losing their friendship? Or would you take an even greater risk and ignore the great commission of God who has given it to you and to me as a command? Let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And let us evangelize our community for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. As we've been praying, Lord,